coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Brian Barksdale. I'm an MD PhD student at UT Austin and UTMB. And I will be talking about the neuroprotective effects of ketones and traumatic brain injury. So here's an outline of my talk. So I'll be talking about you know, what is uh, traumatic brain injury. I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology. Uh, I'll spend a long uh, a lot of time on the pathophysiology just so we can kind of understand what's going on and how treatments might work. I'll talk about uh, current treatments and treatment focus, then I will transition to talking about ketogenic diets and ketones. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on that because I'm, I know you guys are very familiar, so then I will spend more time talking about uh, what kind of data we actually have for using uh, ketones or the ketogenic diet in TBI. Um, I will talk about other potential fuel sources for the brain and then briefly other nutritional and lifestyle considerations for TBI. And then we can have a discussion about the kind of how do we take this to the clinic and potential problems. So how do we define TBI? It's actually a very broad thing. So TBI is really any kind of transfer of force um, through the skull to the brain, which then results in an alteration in mental status. And uh, it's a very broad disease as well. It's very heterogeneous. No two TBIs are gonna be the same for many reasons. One is that every injury is the result of a unique set of circumstances. So an explosion of an IED is not the same thing as a motor vehicle accident, is not the same thing as a helmet to helmet collision in say a football game. And so this leads to a huge uh, difference in severity of injury and type of injury. And then every person is unique. So basically you have a unique person and a unique set of circumstances. So pre-injury conditions such as age, sex, uh, pre-injury cognitive functioning and um, ability uh, affects the pathophysiology and outcome. And then also what happens at the time of injury, are there other extracranial injuries like do they have hemorrhaging, things like that also affect uh, how a TBI can progress. So generally, uh, TBI is classified by injury severity or the severity of alteration in mental status at presentation and the injury type. So um, it's generally um, classified by the Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, mild is 13 to 15, moderate 9 to 12, and severe less than 8. And then we have this other thing, concussion. So it's often synonymously used with mild TBI um, but it's kind of debatable whether it's the same thing because it might actually just describe a subset of even milder brain injury. And then even after that, we can talk about sub-concussive injuries that happen during, say, something like sports. And then often it is classified by injury type, diffuse versus local, impact versus non-impact, penetrating versus non-penetrating, or blast-related. Um, and that can be uh, characterized by the, what happened at the time of the injury and then neuroimaging as well. So in terms of what kind of symptoms you get from a traumatic brain injury, so a mild TBI, uh, you're gonna, it's characterized by confusion and amnesia with or without loss of consciousness. So to have a, a TBI, you don't need the loss of consciousness. Uh, early on, there will be headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, kind of lack of awareness of your surroundings. Uh, later on, you can have um, what's called this post-concussive syndrome. Uh, you can have mood and cognitive disorder, disturbances, sleep disturbances, uh, sensitive, sensitivity to light and noise, and even seizures. Uh, and it's actually pretty common, somewhere around 40 to 80 percent of TBI sufferers will have some sort of post-concussion syndrome. And it can even extend out to a year, so at a year, 15 percent will still have some of these symptoms. And then obviously moderate and severe TBI are gonna have more severe symptoms. They can have persistent headache, persistent chronic pain. They can have uh, more focal neurologic symptoms that'll be more similar to stroke, or they'll have trouble with um, say sensory perception, speech, language, movement balance, depending on what areas of the brain are damaged. So TBI is not just a, an event, it can uh, be a life-changing thing, uh, it can be a chronic disease. You, luckily, usually mild TBI um, or a concussion, you have a full recovery. But moderate and severe TBI uh, are often associated with permanent neurologic um, 
and functional impairments. And in fact, chronic disability due to TBI is very common. It's actually one to two percent of the population in the US, somewhere between three and five million people. And they can suffer from, again, cognitive, behavioral, emotional, uh, even hormonal problems, depending on whether it damages the pituitary and physical deficits. And uh, severe TBI, do uh, you have a question? Um, I, I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, is mild versus moderate or severe, is that um, dependent on the type of injury or just sort of the, what? It's classified, uh, so it's more a, a clinical, um, determination on presentation by the Glasgow Coma Scale. So um, it's not, not necessarily um, defined by the pathology, it's more defined by the symptoms. But at the time of presentation? At the, basically at the time of presentation, yeah. And all these people who have all these symptoms weigh out, that's not less? Yeah, it's mostly determined at, at the time of presentation, uh, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. Um, so, um, so for instance, severe TBI, only about one in four actually ever achieve uh, functional independence. So how common is it? So TBI um, in the US, about 1.74 million people a year, which that uh, translates to about one every 15 seconds. And it's actually increasing in incidence, and especially globally and in developing countries as they become more motorized. Um, the majority, luckily, are mild, so 75 to 95% are mild. So again, they'll hopefully have a full recovery. However, uh, around 3% are severe, and then of those that are hospitalized, 3% of those are fatal. And so it's actually the most prevalent cause of death for those 1 to 45. And it's also the most common cause of long-term disability um, right above stroke. So in terms of what actually the most common causes of traumatic brain injury, uh, falls uh, make up a, a large portion along with motor vehicle accidents and then um, unintentional blunt trauma. Though assaults, um, kind of violence is increasing as well. So military is not really on the list. That's my next point. So we don't really talk about TBI or it's not in the news because of motor vehicle accidents or falls. No one talks about that. The reason why we talk about TBI now is because TBI caused by sports and military service are gaining, atten um, gaining attention recently because TBI is now considered the signature wound from the Af Afghanistan and Iraq uh, wars. Also, the recent link between sports-related concussions and chronic traumatic encephalopathy has made it into the news. Um, so for instance, the movie Concussion recently came out. So sports-related concussions are uh, actually have a higher incidence, depending on how you define it. So if concussion being a milder injury actually has a higher incidence, up to 3.8 million in the US. And that's, that's actually likely an underestimate, because there's a lot of, um, say, uh, peer pressure and other pressures to not report a concussion, right? Um, and then, so for instance, uh, the likelihood of an athlete sustaining a concussion is about 20% per season, right? So if we're talking about an athlete in high school and college, um, it's not a matter of uh, if they're going to get a concussion, it's a matter of when and how many. And probably the most important point is there exists an opportunity for a second insult. And this is really important because we know there's a period of vulnerability after a concussion or a TBI that the brain is even more vulnerable to additional damage. So even though they might sustain uh, the same forces of a mild concussion, uh, maybe twice in a week or something, they can then have the damage of a severe TBI. And in fact, there's something called second impact syndrome, which has been linked to um, uh, death in athletes. So and then uh, the numbers are similar for those in the military, probably around 15% uh, um, experience some sort of injury with an uh, alteration in consciousness. Um, but if we compare these TBIs to those in, the, in civilians, um, the severity obviously is much higher. So they have more moderate and severe TBI. And then also the mechanism of injury is different. And it's mostly from um, explosions. And that's due to improvised explosive devices that are used. So now I'm going to talk about what actually goes on after a traumatic brain injury. And so 
uh, usually we break it up into what's called the primary injury and secondary injury. And so the primary injury is basically what hap is the mechanical damage that happens at the time of impact or transfer of forces. And these forces occur within 100 milliseconds, so it's kind of hard to predict and prevent. Um, and you can imagine that the brain has the consistency of, say, toothpaste. It's one of the softest biologic solids in the body. And when you have the transfer of force, what happens is you get shearing, stretching, and compaction of axons and cell membranes. Um, you can have vascular injury, which is going to lead to intracerebral bleeding and even hematoma formation. Um, uh, for focal type TBIs, you're going to see more of the vascular injuries, the contusions and lacerations. The, those are mostly seen in more severe TBI. And then diffuse injury um, is the diffuse axonal injury that we talk about. And that's probably present in, in most TBI to some extent. The white matter is very vulnerable to damage. So this is a just little graph uh, figure I made showing um, just kind of what happens. I don't really want you to focus on it, but the thing that I wanted to illustrate is that all, the, all that initial mechanical damage then leads to increased in intracranial pressure from edema and then decreased cerebral blood flow. And that can be made worse, again, by, say, if they have hemorrhaging, they have hypotension, and later on by vasospasm. So uh, one of the main things that we see in TBI is actually decreased cerebral blood flow. And depending on which study you look at and what method, it can even be in ischemic ranges. So then, after uh, the primary injury, you get the uh, what's called a secondary injury, and that's more of the uh, neurometabolic um, and neurochemical cascade of damage. And I have a similar figure for that, but again, don't focus on this. I'm, I don't really want to, for you to strain your eyes, really what I just want to illustrate is that it's a complex web of interacting processes, um, and because so, a lot of these arrows are two-way arrows. So what you get is actually positive feedback mechanisms happening uh, with a lot of these processes. And so there are ones that are more um, agreed upon that um, are uh, more important in terms of the um, pathophysiology and the damage, um, but I will mostly be focusing on mitochondrial dysfunction and then uh, what, what we call an energy crisis. So I'll go over kind of the cascade of what actually happens. So again, uh, with a secondary injury, what happens after you get the shearing of and disruption of the cell membranes, you actually get uh, potassium uh, leaving the cell. You get this huge efflux of potassium. And that actually depolarizes the cells and leads to the release of excitatory transmitters, specifically glutamate. So you get glutamate excitotoxicity. And how this happens is you get glutamate released onto postsynaptic neurons and it activates uh, glutamatergic receptors, particularly the NMDAR receptor, which uh, allows calcium influx. So this um, allows for a huge increase of calcium inside the cell. And if you guys remember back to biology, uh, calcium is a very bioactive molecule and it's usually uh, kept in very low concentrations in the cell because it's a very um, potent signaling molecule and it actually activates a lot of different cascades. Um, the other thing you get, again, uh, you get um, depolarization, you get this spreading depression that, that uh, moves throughout the brain, and this probably causes um, the immediate neurologic deficit. So similar to a migraine, uh, same, same kind of similar mechanism. So after you get this huge increase in calcium, that is sequestered by mitochondria. So mitochondria are not only responsible for the production of ATP, but they also are involved in calcium homeostasis and buffering. So they take up this extra calcium, and what that actually does is damage them. It causes oxidative stress, and then this causes mitochondrial dysfunction. So the calcium also activates many enzymes that then uh, go on to produce more free radicals. Um, and oxidative damage, and then other enzymes such as calpanes, which then actually degrade the cytoskeleton. Um, and because of this huge influx of uh, potassium, uh, sodium as well, and calcium, you have this huge um, 
increased demand from the sodium potassium ATPase, these other ion pumps, to then try to restore homeostasis, try to get the levels back to normal. So you actually have this uh, kind of immediate uh, hypermetabolic state uh, and hyperglycolytic state. So basically there's this huge increase in demand for ATP, but you actually have a decreased ability to produce that ATP. So what happens is you get this imbalance between demand and supply. Uh, and the reason you have decreased ATP production is defects in glycolysis and mitochondrial dysfunction, as I said, which is a product of the, the increase in calcium and oxidative stress that comes from that. And so this leads to an energy crisis and ultimately death of the cells, apoptosis. And so I'll, I'll go a little bit more over the kind of hypometabolic state, because uh, that's kind of important um, in when we get to talking about the ketogenic diet. So after traumatic brain injury, there's a, a um, problem with the neurons being able to use glucose. So they have a decreased ability to uh, uptake glucose. There's a decrease in the glute transporters in the blood-brain barrier. Um, there's a decreased ability to process uh, glucose through the glycolytic uh, processing because of, there's a decrease in a lot of the enzymes, hexokinase, uh, GAD, pH. Um, for, for many reasons, but basically it can't really be processed through the normal way. And you actually have shunting to this different pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. And so this is actually involved in DNA repair. So again, you have this huge oxidative stress that's happening that's damaging DNA, so the cell is trying to repair that DNA, and so all that glucose is going to repairing DNA and not going to produce ATP. Um, you also get, again, a decrease in ATP production due to damage in the mitochondria, specifically in the electron transport chain, those complexes uh, get damaged due to oxidative stress. Um, and then that also leads to more oxidative stress because the mitochondria are damaged, so they produce more oxidative stress. And then so you get this huge cycle of those causing each other back and forth. So uh, this I just wanted to show kind of a little bit of the time course of these things. Um, again, you have this initial hypermetabolic state. This is cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. You have an initial hypermetabolic state, and that's within minutes. But that then transitions into a hypometabolic state. Um, the increase in calcium lasts a long time. It can last days, um, depending on how severe the injury is. And then cerebral blood flow is just low the whole time until you have recovery. And the uh, kind of metabolic recovery time um, correlates with um, the severity of injury and then also age. So older animals take longer to recover. Um, and this is showing recovery, say, within 10 days. That's likely just a mild injury. Um, moderate and severe TBI, you can see these changes weeks to several months out to even years. So how do we currently treat TBI? Well, the truth is there's not a lot of treatments or guidelines. Um, it's mostly focused on controlling cerebral blood flow by reducing intracranial pressure. You try to make sure there's not hypotension or hypoxia. You manage temperature and glucose, and you try to prevent infections and seizures. There's not a lot we can do for the secondary um, injury that's happening. Though we, one, of the, one of the things that we do focus on is the cerebral blood flow, and so that's, that's a part of it, but it's not all of it. And then surgical interventions do exist, but only for the kind of penetrating uh, injuries or hematomas, if there are any. Um, and so the thing is uh, that we know what we need to do. We need to try to stem this secondary injury from happening, this cascade. And so neuroprotection is this huge field of study, but it is, the clinical translation has been very poor. Um, I think 30 different things recently have failed trials. Um, but for instance, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, induced hypothermia, maybe you guys have heard of those. Uh, animal studies were extremely positive, but clinical trials so far have been weak and mixed. Uh, other failures include uh, EPO, magnesium, progesterone, acetylcholine. So there's, there's a huge failure in translation. So the question is why? What should we target instead? So again, current treatments and those in the pipeline tend to target only one aspect of the pathophysiology. So instead, we probably want to take a more multi-targeted approach. Again, you remember that complex figure I showed you? We want to target as much of that as possible. 
Um, and really, the consensus is that we should focus on the inflammation, the oxidative stress, and the mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, because we know that mitochondria are a key participant in the pathophysiology. And even when we correct for the low cerebral blood flow, hypotension, hypoxia, that doesn't necessarily correlate with better outcomes. Because, um, again, there's still damage from other mechanisms. If a cell, so there are multiple apoptotic pathways. If a cell wants to die uh, and you block one of them, it has other ways to do it. So we need a very multi-targeted approach. And then in terms of talking about uh, the more uh, metabolic dysfunction, it's the most consistent finding after TBI, even in mild TBI. And it's also uh, the best, it's most associated with outcome. And same thing with markers of mitochondrial dysfunction <laughs> through microdialysis or even magnetic resonance spectroscopy. These things uh, correlate more with severity and outcome whereas cerebral blood flow and oxygenation don't necessarily correlate that well. But those are the things that we've been focusing on. So basically, we've been focusing on these things and not this, the energy flow. And I could draw arrows from energy to all these other ones because the energy demand also will affect the blood flow and oxygenation. So now I'm going to transition to talking a little bit about ketogenic diets and, and ketone bodies. And luckily, uh, Don did a lot of that for me. Um, but ketones are uh, basically byproducts of fat metabolism produced during times of fasting or starvation. They're also produced during exercise at uh, some intensities and also probably during uh, breastfeeding in infants. Um, so they're also produced uh, in the diet when carbohydrates are uh, restricted. And so that's the so-called ketogenic diet. The three main ketone bodies are beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. And importantly, these can act as energy substrates because they can enter the TCA cycle through conversion to acetyl-CoA, produce ATP. And probably the most important thing is that they can supply a significant amount of the brain's energy demand. So. Um, You've probably heard that glucose is the only thing that fuels the brain. Well, that's not true. Ketones can supply the majority of the brain's energy demand when needed. So the brain is, can be metabolically flexible in that sense. So mostly ketones are produced by the liver, um, especially when you have gluconeogenesis going on because carbohydrates are restricted or you're fasting and you have to produce uh, glucose from oxaloacetate. <laughs> So you use up your oxaloacetate, you can't turn the TCA cycle. So then the acetyl-CoA made from fatty acids are converted to ketones, which then can travel in the blood to other tissues. Uh, most metabolically active tissues can use ketones. Um, in order to get ketones into the brain, though, you have to use this transporter here, MCT, which is monocarboxylate uh, transporter. Um, and that'll be important later. Um, and then those can be taken up by the neurons, taken up into the mitochondria, again, converted to acetyl-CoA, and go directly into the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, to produce ATP. The other thing, though, is that we do now know that glial cells, astrocytes themselves, can produce ketones. So it's not just the liver. Um, though we don't necessarily know how important that is or how much they produce. So ketogenic diets, the classic ketogenic diet um, that's been used for epilepsy for over 100 years is this so-called 4 to 1, where it's a 4 to 1 ratio of fat calories to combined uh, carbohydrate and protein calories. But we've had um, other um, formulations that seem to work just as well in the literature, at least for epilepsy. The uh, modified Atkins diet, the medium chain triglyceride, because medium chain triglycerides are more ketogenic than long chain fatty acids, and then low glycemic index as well. So, um, like I said, ketogenic diets have been used in epilepsy for a while, and in terms of the research, in terms of animal models, we know that ketones and ketogenic diets are actually neuroprotective in multiple models of neurologic disease. And so what are the mechanisms of this? Well, again, like I said, ketones can provide an alternative energy substrate. Uh, they seem to reverse um, problems with mitochondria, the dysfunction. They can uh, actually stimulate the production of new mitochondria, and then also the recycling of faulty mitochondria, the uh, mitophagy. Um, they also reduce oxidative stress through multiple mechanisms. 
decrease cell death through apoptosis, they decrease inflammation, they actually increase blood flow, and importantly for epilepsy, they reduce seizure threshold and change the balance of excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. And uh, this is also a busy figure, but basically what we think, um, it, how it does this, how it provides neuroprotection is by working through uh, these um, pathways, uh, sensors of uh, cellular energy such as mTOR, AMP kinase, uh, some epigenetic mechanisms as well uh, that ultimately leads to an increase in um, mitochondrial health and antioxidant status um, and ultimately protect cells from dying. Okay, so what about uh, what about studies actually using this in models of TBI? So a lot of these studies are done by one group out of UCLA, Prins and Matsumoto, um, and these have been done in multiple models of TBI uh, and then multiple ages of rat, and that'll become important. So in terms of outcome after TBI, what we really care about is the functional outcome or behavioral outcome. Uh, it actually increases motor function and cognitive function. Uh, and then in terms of the pathology, uh, it reduces lesion volume and edema. It probably does this, um, it, well, it does do this by decreasing the number of apoptotic cells. Um, and we know that it decreases apoptotic cells by decreasing proptotic proteins such as BACs and then cytochrome C release from the mitochondria. And then a more recent paper uh, that, was, that is in epilepsy also shows that it prevents the opening of the mitochondrial transition pore, which is e an even no another apoptotic pathway. So basically it blocks uh, apoptosis through multiple mechanisms. And again, it can increase levels of ATP, uh, creatinine, phosphocreatinine in the brain, and then also normalize, um, this is N-acetyl aspartate and lactate, uh, other um, metabolic markers. And then it likely increases the levels of ATP by increasing the activity of the complexes in the electron transport chain, two and three specifically. Um, because it can bypass defects in complex one, which is what you get after TBI. So again, uh, in animal studies, you, we see decreased uh, markers of oxidative stress. It actually does it uh, very quickly. So there's a thought that ketones themselves have antioxidant properties. And in addition to that, it actually increases levels of endogenous antioxidants such as glutathione, catalase, uh, superoxide dismutase. Uh, importantly, it can increase latency to seizure in th um, animals who are prone to seizure who get a TBI. And then what I think is very important is it can protect against a second insult. So when they look at um, a similar, like a concussion model where they give multiple ones in a very vulnerable time period, it actually um, has some protection against that second insult. I, there is one recent negative study, it's the only negative study I could find, that showed that uh, not a ketogenic diet, but actually giving exogenous ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, did not prevent the blood-brain barrier damage after TBI. I'm not quite sure how to interpret that yet, because all other studies have been positive. Um, so there's a huge caveat in all of this. The, these neuroprotective effects are age-dependent, so they are not seen in are not seen as robustly in adult animals. They're best seen in adolescent animals. So there's a couple reasons why that is. So one, like I said, the actual uh, pathophysiology of TBI changes with age. So older animals, those metabolic changes last longer. Um, and then in terms of ketogenic diets themselves, they take longer to produce ketones in adults. And then adult animals take longer to produce the transporters that uptake ketones. So what about in humans? Well, there's really only one published study. It's actually from 1996. And 20 head injury patients were placed on a carbohydrate-free diet or a ketogenic diet. Um, now those patients that were placed on it did have more stable blood sugars. They didn't have hyperglycemia like the control group. They had lower levels of blood lactate and they had better urinary nitrogen balance. So that's good, but clinical outcomes were not reported on in this uh, study. So it's hard to say, you know, were they better at, at the end. 
Yeah. Um, however, there is one ongoing clinical trial right now uh, run by Matsumoto, um, and it is slated to um, have the primary completion date uh, this year in December. So hopefully we'll get more information somewhere around that time, and it'll be in pediatric uh, patients, which is probably the um, patients that'll work best in. Okay, so um, again, just to kind of summarize, uh, ketogenic diets or ketone bodies are like this octopus. It has multiple arms that can affect almost all of the important uh, processes that happen in the secondary pathophysiology. So it's likely to translate better than what we've been trying before um, because it's a multi-targeted approach and it affects the things that are agreed upon that are important, including the mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, oxidative stress, and decreasing apoptosis. So ketones are not the only fuel that the brain can use. And in fact, uh, new studies from 2015 and very recent uh, actually indicate that lactate directly and indirectly are, is the primary fuel after brain injury. So it's been thought you know, to be kind of this metabolic waste product and it's you know, a marker of anaerobic metabolism, but it's actually the, what fuels the brain after brain injury. And um, animal and human studies have both been positive so far with giving exogenous lactate. So the truth is there's more evidence for lactate than there are for ketones right now. Um, and similar to ketones, there are multiple pleiotropic effects. Uh, it reduces swelling and it reduces oxidative stress as well. Pyruvate is another monocarboxylate that can be used in the TCA cycle. Um, animal studies are positive, but the s formulations that we have now, the kind of toxicity, the safety is kind of questionable, and it's converted to lactate anyway, so there's not necessarily an improvement over lactate. And then glucose, surprisingly. So post-TBI hyperglycemia, depending on which study you look at, is beneficial, neutral, or harmful. Uh, though one of the more recent larger studies kind of indicates it's harmful, but in terms of giving exogenous glucose, there are no adverse effects in animal human studies. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the best fuel, but it is uh, maybe beneficial uh, depending on the, what's going on in the injury. Uh, though lactate and ketones probably have a uh, question. Five minutes. Okay. So, um, Lactate and ketones are probably better because then the body's own mechanisms of regulating uh, glucose um, are still in play, such as the liver and kidneys. And so you wouldn't have to necessarily give insulin or very a monitor uh, or worry too much about blood glucose because you're not giving exogenous glucose. So other nutritional aspects. Um, so if you actually look up uh, you know, nutritional um, treatment for TBI or uh, considerations. The biggest thing that they talk about is actually adequate calories. And uh, they, they need full feeding within seven days. And um, this is, uh, well, because TBI actually leads to a very catabolic state. So fasting for a time is probably protective, but at some point uh, you're going to need to give them full calories. Um, and then omega-3s, omega-3 fatty acids, we, we know are very important for neurologic health in general. They contribute to the fluidity of the um, neural and synaptic membranes. Um, and in terms of animal studies, they have, uh, in terms of animal studies using omega-3s, um, there's a lot of benefit. They reduce inflammation, increase neurotrophic factors, and improve mitochondrial function. And then they improve behavioral outcomes as well, such as learning and cognition. However, there are no human trials with omega-3 supplementation and TBI that I could find. Uh, there are two currently recruiting. Uh, for pediatric. There are studies yeah. in multiple trauma and in sepsis, and, but there are more studies in those conditions for a medium chain triglycerides using coconut oil rather than soy oil for hyperalum. Yes. Or for enteral TBI. Mm -hmm. um, but not directly for, for TBI that I can find. Um, there are a lot of other nutritional things that might be beneficial, other nutrients, micronutrients. Uh, there is one study with carnitine in animals that showed improved behavior outcome and decreased lesion volume. Uh, zinc, TBI patients are at high risk of becoming zinc deficient. However, trials uh, with zinc supplementation haven't been positive and that's likely because just because the levels in the serum are low doesn't necessarily mean that 
giving them the zinc will go to the place you need it at, in the right concentrations because zinc can actually be toxic in the brain. Um, there are a lot of other considerations, choline, creatine, vitamin D, antioxidants, phytochemicals like uh, curcumin, resveratrol. Um, there is a great book that's actually from the Institute of Medicine, uh, I think it's commissioned by the Army, that looks at the nutritional considerations for TBI and it talks about all of these things. So I won't go over that, but it's this reference here. Um, okay, so what about other lifestyle factors? Well, exercise, um, so preconditioning with exercise can probably provide protection against ischemic injury. Um, this has been shown um, in animal models. Uh, delayed exercise, so um, after a short recovery period after TBI, uh, exercising and has improved outcomes in animal studies. Um, and then talking about intermittent fasting and caloric restriction, those have been shown to be neuroprotective in many animal models and for many neurologic diseases, including TBI. And again, um, for the, in terms of this study, that the one study that I know of with uh, uh, intermittent fasting and TBI, uh, the benefits only really extend out to about 24 to 48 hours. Once you go past that, you start seeing the deficits. And again, so that might be because there's a huge catabolic state. So you need to give them some, some calories at some point. So what do we do with this information? How do we, how do we take this to the clinic? So, well, ketogenic diets are already established for epilepsy, for drug-resistant epilepsy in children. So, you know, the registered dietitians are trained. We have uh, different formulas like ketocal and things like that for feeding. Um, ketone salts are available. You can actually buy them as a consumer. Ketone esters are, you know, in the pipeline in the research right now. Um, but the problem is how and when to initiate. It. What, what do we use? Do we use ket exogenous ketones? Do we use the ketogenic diet? Do we use fasting? Uh, when do we do it? How long do we do it? It's kind of hard to translate those, translate those things from the animal data. Uh, one thing we can say is probably the earlier the better. Um, uh, and another question, do we, um, will it work in adults? That's, that's a big question that I have because most of the data uh, from the animal studies only show it works in adolescents. Now again, the reasons being, you don't get ketones produced quick enough in adults and then they don't um, take them up because they don't produce the transporter. Well, we can probably uh, get past that with fasting. Fasting tends to increase ketones faster and then also increase the transporters. And then exogenous ketones, we can probably just increase the blood levels enough to um, you know, kind of get over that transport problem. Uh, another question is, do we combine it with lactate? Um, again, I think the answer is probably yes. Uh, I could do a whole talk next time on lactate. It's very interesting. This data is very new. Uh, and like I said, there's more data for that than ketones right now. Um, and then something that I have a question about is that it would be a good discussion is, you know, how much evidence do we need? Like, what, what do you guys do with this information now? Is this, is this actionable? Is what we already have actionable? Um, because the truth is we have only one human study, you know, it's, uh, it's not quite sure, you know, what do we do? And then another open question is pre-treatment. So for those that we know are likely to get concussions or TBIs, such as those who are athletes or in the military, you know, should they be on a ketogenic diet? Should they be intermittent fasting? Um, should they, you know, be, have ketone salts or MCT oil with them? Those types of things are, I think, are open questions. And then, of course, we have to talk about potential problems. So in terms of human trials, high doses of ketone esters cause serious GI uh, side effects, nausea, vomiting, um, GERD, uh, abdominal distension, headache, dizziness, uh, and some people chest pain. Ketone salt solutions uh, represent a large sodium load, so you need to have functioning kidneys. It's also alkalizing, so you have to monitor blood pH. Uh, exogenous ketones seem to stimulate insulin release, so that would inhibit hepatic ketogenesis. Um, then in terms of uh, studies, uh, in terms of the epilepsy field, we know that there's the potential for hypoglycemia, acidosis, other GI things like GERD, kidney stones, increased uric acid, uh, increased blood cholesterol. Uh, in, in children, it's associated with growth retardations, decreased bone density. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of 
potential problems. In general, they're, they're very safe, but we have to do acknowledge that uh, these things do exist. Though likely a, a um, well-formulated ketogenic diet wouldn't have a lot of these problems. And the other things that I talked about in terms of the nutritional aspects, none of those are uh, mutually exclusive. So we could um, basically come up with a ketogenic diet that um, you know contains enough omega threes, you know has enough zinc, carnitine, all these other things. Um, okay, so uh, in summary, TBI is the number one cause of death and chronic disability in those under 45. There are very few current treatment options and a failure to translate animal research. One of the reasons being metabolic dysfunction is a key part of the pathophysiology that's not being addressed. Uh, ketogenic diets and ketones have been shown to be neuroprotective because they address this metabolic dysfunction along uh, with lots of other mechanisms. And then the animal data for uh, ketogenic diets or ketones and TBI is very promising. Caveat, it's age dependent. And then human trials are, are desperately needed. So thank you very much. That's my talk, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. I don't know if I missed it. Did you, you said something along the way about increasing the transporters would help? Did you say how to do that? Yeah, so it's thought that fasting is one way to do that. Um, it also seems that giving exogenous ketones as well will increase the transporters. So those are two potential ways to get past that problem. Um, I like your, your thought of like pre-treating athletes and military you know, personnel, I think. You know, there has been you know, a very you know, a limited movement, but like, you know, move towards low carb in some NFL players and linemen. And, but you know, it seems like at that point we're almost, I don't know if you're like too far down the road you know, of TBI after they've already been playing for 15 years, 20 years. And so, be interested to see, and that's where like the military personnel where you get, you know, more of the younger adolescent, kind of you started in that group, it wouldn't make a difference or, you know, kind of long term. Right. Um, and that's, that's the problem. I mean, this, this is all about treatment. The real problem is we need to prevent these things from happening in the first place. Um, yeah, and that's, that's the hard part. And hopefully things like, you know, self-driving vehicles, you know, kind of, uh, other safety things will will prevent that. But um, in terms of pretreatment, yeah, it's kind of hard to know. Um, I mean, but but again, we know that exercise is beneficial. We know that omega threes. We know that fasting, things like that, are are pretty beneficial and not that hard to do. Especially we're talking about like a you know eating window, something like that, rather than a ketogenic diet. Because I don't know if you if you had a teenager who came in with a concussion, are you going to say, oh, you need to change your diet and do this and this and this? Are they going to do that? Probably not. So it's a little hard to see how you would actually translate this in, in certain populations. Definitely, I think it's probably going to happen more in the moderate to severe TBI, um, especially since we can give ketones exogenously. I think it'll probably happen in that area first before it translates to uh, more of the, you know, the concussion type things. Because again, most of those recover fully anyways. Um, it's more of the, the moderate and severe that have those the potential for disability that I think we could uh, hopefully stem. Any other questions? Yeah. What's the source of lactate supplement? Uh, oh, well, so uh, first I'll actually say in terms of the lactate, this is very interesting. Um, a lot of the lactate after injury comes from this catabolic state and actually is provided by the rest of the body, including the integument and the, the skin and um, connective tissue, oddly enough. Um, there are similar formulations of lactate as there are ketones, so there are lactate salts. And in fact, those have been shown to um, reduce the uh, intracranial pressure and edema because uh, you're, you're having that uh, salt load. Um, so there are similar formulations for lactate, just as there are for ketones. So you could create um, a kind of like lactated ringers with, with ketones, something like that, that you could easily give after a traumatic brain injury. That's the thing that's exciting to me is this is so easy to do. It's just giving someone like a type of fluid. Now, there's uh, the leaky gut that goes along with the head injuries, and that seems to be another consideration as far as what type of enteral support that patients may need uniquely in TBI versus, say, some other critical care patient. Yes, it's, that's, that's very true. 
That's very well, true. We, any critical care patient has to leave. Well, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it's, but as far as like acute intervention, trying to do some of these things with a head injury. Good question. Did you mention the complex one was injured in the mitochondria? Yes. Uh, it's it's mostly it's mostly one and complex one and four that are are injured um, or not functioning as well, um, but you can actually bypass that defect and go straight to two and three. Um, I I'm not entirely sure why it's complex one. I th it's I think it's just more susceptible to oxidative damage is is probably why. Any other questions? Thank you.